Welcome to you to new Connect, a new show here on RCR TV. Please continue to join us on RCR TV and the YouTube channel, also our Google Plus page, and please visit us at rcrwireless.com, our publication, so you can see the extent of all the information that we bring to you for the wireless industry. I'm Lamore Schaffner, the show host of YouTube Connect. It's my pleasure to be here because this is the inaugural of this show, and what we're going to focus on is M2M and the Internet of Things. And to kick us off, we have a very special guest with us. He is Norbert Muir. He is SVP, Senior Vice President of Jamalto for M2M. Norbert, thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Lima. It's really my pleasure to be part of this uh, new and highly innovative uh, broadcast on M2M. And uh, since this is the first one, it's even a double pleasure. Thanks a lot. Well, thank you so much. So you have a fascinating background. You have been in the wireless industry for so many years. You've seen so much. You were um, president of Siemens Wireless Modules. From that, you formed and, and spun off Centarion, and then you sold Centarion as CEO of Centarion. You sold it to Jamalto in uh, 2010, and now it's continuing to move forward. That company is continuing to move forward with, or that division is rather, is continuing to move forward with new products in MTM. So you've seen and lived the extent of the wireless industry as it's evolved over time, and also you are seeing M2M as it's really thriving today. So when you look at the wireless industry and you look at M2M, what has struck you over the course of the several years as to what's happening in the wireless industry today and particularly in the Internet of Things arena? Yeah, probably what's struck me the most and what keeps continue to strike me day by day, I guess, is the variety of applications that we find in M2M. And I think while about six, seven years ago when I came into the business, we were talking about connecting devices to a server. We are now connecting, we are now connecting uh, devices among each other. So it's really a plethora. There's a whole a uh, whole array of applications and you know while people think uh, M2M would be to connect a power meter or a point of sales terminal th that's pretty much become mainstream and accepted in the industry and I'm seeing so many different intriguing solutions like recently we did uh, a solution where we're tracking uh, trees in the Amazon forest that were uh, cut down illegally and so we are with M2M, we're basically chasing this illegal logging and protecting, in some indirect way, the rainforest. And uh, being part of such a move is just simply great. It feels good, you know. I think uh, we, with M2M, we do a little better for our for our planet. So, you know, and these are the things beyond technology and connectivity and 3G and 4G, whatever we talk day by day that keeps on striking me, this endless uh, M2M, to my point of view, has no has no limits. You know, if people are just being imaginative, then we'll find new things day by day by day. Fascinating. So how would you define M2M? Because I have to say, and I'm curious to learn a little bit more about this application that is being done with the trees, I would never have thought about it. So I'd love to, us to de delve into that, but first, Define M to M for us, because so many people have so many different perspectives on it. And so, what is? How do you define it personally? And then also, if you could give us the Jamalto perspective on it. Yeah. So, for for me personally, M to M, and it has seen so many wide definitions uh, that uh, struck me. You know, some people threw out uh, 50 billion devices as being M to M. I think realistically that. That's not ex exactly happening. So machine to machine is still uh, part of it is technology, part of it is business case, uh, part of it is use case, and you have to bring those uh, three items together to to find a machine to machine solution. So whoever thought that uh, we will be integrating uh, a sensor in everything and everywhere. Mm, it may happen over time, but currently M2M is very much a, a, a use case driven applications that has fairly no limits as long as there is a valid business case behind it. So, uh, like I said, the example of the rainforest makes economical sense when you think about it, what money can be saved uh, by preventing illegal deforestation or 
if you trucking companies are monitoring the right tire pressure, uh, fuel is being saved, and business cases are happening. But if we just uh, put uh, connect devices simply for the case of connecting devices, that may be technology-wise M to M, but it will not uh, make a use case and will not make a business case and will not take off. So, uh, for me, M to M is just uh, say a way of catalyzing new business models by uh, leveraging assets in different ways. Uh, technology is all around us and it's there, that's not the breaking point, it's, so it's always the business case and uh, the use case around it. And I think you said something very important because I was going to ask you if in fact the use cases are there, are we talking is M2M now at a level where people, it's beyond just the coolness of the application and the coolness of what people can do, but people are actually finding every, an, um, quantifiable return on investment in terms of what they're doing. So are you seeing that with the, the different clients that you're partnering with and what they're able to do in the M2M yeah. space? Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, to, to limit the use cases, we, from our perspective, machine to machine, still means at the end of the use case there is a machine and uh, a person holding a tablet or a laptop, a smartphone in our terms is not machine to machine. It's still a traditional um, mobile broadband connectivity use case. Okay, so machine to machine is a use case where at the other side you don't find human intervention. So you'll talk to a machine and while the general opinion is that machines are intelligent. In reality, the intelligence of machine is limited to the point where they have been programmed, what they have been programmed to do. And while people are smart and react to uh, case dependent to certain situations, machines are not. If a machine uh, encounters uh, a situation that it has not been set up to deal with, the machine will stop uh, working, go, in, go into some defaults, it will not work properly anymore. While a human being will always be intelligent enough to say, well, that here's a use case that I haven't seen before, so I smarten myself up, I get the information somewhere, I find help for myself and I solve my use case uh, that I was not being able to solve before. A machine, Today, machine is not able to do that. So machines are set up to do exactly what they are programmed to do. And that, that's what I call machine to machine, right? So coming back to that, it also means that uh, all the players that serve the M2M market, and I'm talking about industrial M2M, uh, you see it's not the typical broadband connectivity players. So it's uh, us and a few other international companies that have uh, developed a very special sauce. And this very special sauce is how do we deal with what we think is intelligence out in the field, which if this intelligence out in the field hits a certain problem, it's not able to deal with it. Huh? How do we bring this intelligence back into the device? And that's where connectivity, device management, security, but also ruggedness is coming back in. But uh, coming back to your initial question about the use cases, huh? so a mm, couple of issues uh, in the past six, seven years really have unlocked uh, the market to a certain degree already and there's still a certain number of locks in the market that need to be removed. So one of the uh, unlocking mechanisms that happened is that mm, the initial investment into infrastructure has become cheaper. So prices have come down, the adoption went up, that drove prices further down. So one of the thresholds to make a business case working, the initial CapEx band has been reduced considerably and frankly talking, when I arrived in the business, uh, we were selling 2G connectivity for well over 50% more than what we sell 3G today. So not only have we moved up a notch, the, within the technology increase, the prices have come down 50%. And once uh, you see, I think 3G, 2G connectivity has come down by a magnitude of 70, 80%. So it's really initial CapEx barrier is gone. Uh, network operators have seen the importance of M2M, so they have adjusted their tariff plans because um, M2M applications typically are not uh, 
huge uh, uh, data pipe hungry applications where you need megabytes and gigabytes. Most of the applications are happy with a couple of kilobytes per month. And so that was the next mechanism. Uh, large carriers around the globe have entered the M2M industry, have seen the focus of it, and have unleashed data plans that now is a further catalyst to the business plan. Then we have seen uh, various number of platform providers coming to market, be it application providers or system integrators or mobile operators, and uh, also now system vendors like us, uh, enabling the platform to connect data, basically to manage data. See, the, the intelligence in the business case in M2M will not happen by knowing what a single device is doing at a certain point of time. That's fairly little intelligence, but it's what we call uh, swarm data, you know, a, a community of data, the big data as it's called. That's what really will uh, in the future unleash the big business cases. Yeah, and I'll give you a few examples maybe. Yeah? Sure, that'll be great. If you see uh, big metrop metropolitan areas, if they are able to uh, predict their traffic flow during rush hours of cars coming in, of passengers coming in and out in the typical traffic hours uh, and due to that are able to find a way of directing and modeling that type of traffic by interacting with the user, then uh, huge uh, investments into infrastructure may become not necessary because streets are occupied and once they are getting full maybe there is uh, indications to the rest of the users say it's not a good time to travel now because the uh, best you be stuck in traffic jams so wait a bit and travel later you still arrive at the same point of time at your workplace but you're not going to be stuck in traffic so when you think about that you know mm, you in the east co coast of the US and I'm here sitting here in Munich which is a fairly small city but um, the drive towards urbanization is making people move in and out of cities. It's generating a lot of problems on the infrastructure and M2M has the capability to solve part of those problems, right? Another issue, for example, is the whole power grid. It's not that dramatically interesting to know what the single uh, user is consuming or not consuming with, with his uh, power household, but if you add the consumption behavior and generate uh, of certain communities at large or metropolitan areas or rural areas, then you find out certain use patterns and then you can direct these use patterns to say, look, my dear households, I understand you will need your stove in the evening and you need to cook with electricity, but I'll give you better tariff if you keep your washing machine running through the nighttime, right? And mm -hmm. The individual household doesn't make a difference in, in the business model, but if you aggregate 100,000, 500,000, 5 million households and you see the related, what we call swarm data out of that, it will soon be at the point where certain power plants are not needed right. any longer, where grids are not needed to be extended to that large magnitude. And then you're talking about a couple of hundred millions in savings in M2M. Right, and it could be that those f savings are then maybe redirected more intelligently. And what I'm thinking about is what you just described, for example, in the home and the use of the electricity that affects not only my use of the appliances and certain systems, but also our automotive is becoming increasingly electrical. So I can choose at the same time, when am I plugging in my car? When am I using my devices? Also, my home devices oh, yeah. are probably going to become intelligent enough that they will automatically turn on and off. Even when I'm not home, I can just sort of load them and they'll take care of themselves. And then at the right point in that grid, when the entire grid actually speaks to a, what to all the different endpoints, you can say, OK, now's the moment. Turn it on. We've got a cycle time. Oh, now's the time. To, to recharge the car, let's do that. Exactly. So. That's exactly along that line, you know, and the intelligence in the system will know, you know, Lemur's car is on the grid now, uh, Lemur's car wants to be charged, and she has an upcoming trip, uh, because I know it from her uh, trip planner, which she gave to me. Uh, the next trip she will have will be 30 miles, so she'll need about 22 minutes of electricity and that's just fine for her because her next point will be anyhow next near to a charging station again. And so the, the grid and your car and the charging station will start to manage itself based on a use pattern that you have given to them and 
that's that's what what I call intelligence, right? It's and that's where looking at the device and your car doesn't just cut it. There needs to be a bigger infrastructure system behind it, which we are practically we have the data. Uh, we just need to combine them to intelligence. Right. And so now, Jamalta's role in all of this world, describe that a little bit. And specifically, your your area specifically also. Yeah. So, as you said already, in 2010, Jamalta bought uh, Centurion wireless modules to expand into M2M, and that was, for Jamalta, quite an important uh, and large strategic move. And the move came about uh, as Gemalto's capabilities uh, are very much around SIM cards, uh, connectivity management, security, and the likes, uh, secure chipsets. Uh, but Gemalto also recognized that their traditional strengths is all uh, looking at people using it, the banking card, the SIM card, uh, the health ID card, the access ID card, that's all Gemalto elements, but uh, it's still stuck to the human being as a use case, and so Gemalto expanded into M2M with the logic to say, here is an ex incredibly growing market, it's still young, it's still immature, but it will grow, and we can put our Gemalto secret sauce into M2M as well, and that's basically what we're doing. So we brought in the M2M know-how, and now, uh, which is largely uh, device connectivity, and now we are adding all the Gemalto ingredients to that. So we are uh, consulting our customers on uh, uh, SIM cards. Uh, we are consulting our customers on connectivity, on device management, on security, on over-the-air uh, update procedures. So we are taking M2M. Uh, into a whole new different territory and it's a proposition today where, frankly speaking, none of our other players in the market is having that on board. Well, I think you brought something very interesting up and that is also th this combination of the devices and connecting the devices with the security. And so what's so wonderful about this connected world that we were describing just a few moments ago is that there will be intelligence, there will be connectivity, it'll facilitate what we do and how we live. At the same time, that power also has tremendous vulnerability. And the question is how to protect against that. And so when you're talking to companies now, what do you see are the issues that they're dealing with around this, around the security sector element of it? Yeah, yeah. So exactly like you said, as uh, nice and as good as the Internet of Things is, that everything connects to anything, uh, there is a, a large number of uh, open and uh, vulnerable spots in it. And uh, while it's... Uh, unpleasant uh, or maybe even dramatic if individual use data or banking accounts are hacked into, it creates uh, damage on um, potentially individual or corporate level. Yet once you imagine what damage could be created if people start hacking into uh, power grids, if people start hacking into control systems of trains, if people are st start hacking into industrial systems, then of course we see how dangerous that could be and so uh, with us being out in the market and uh, trying to evangelize the industry on security, um, we see now that certain use cases are uh, accepting that type of consultancy and st strictly looking into it. Yeah, imagine uh, we are pushing into mHealth and eHealth and uh, even if it's non-critical patient data like blood pressure, glucose, or the likes, or has the patient uh, consumed their pills, or didn't they? So still, it's private data, and it's transmitted via the Internet of Things to a doctor, maybe a pharmacy, maybe an insurance company. What the end user has to be assured of, that this is his very private data, and only if we're able to pr protect that very private data uh, in a very sensitive and high secure way, then will this end user be able to say, well now, I put a e-health monitor in my home and then trust my uh, blood sugar level to this monitoring device. Uh, right. What we're doing practically is we're using the security that is there and where we encapsulating user data to give them access ID cards. Uh, we do the access ID cards for the White House exclusively. So. 
Do people trust that their health data are secured if we package it like we package the ID cards of the White House? Yes, there is nothing uh, higher in security beyond that. Uh, do people trust us if we say, look, uh, the way um, Visa card, MasterCard, American Express or banks are packaging their banking data into our chip cards, do you trust us with your health data? They say yes, because we trust that banks and issuers have a very, very high security standard and I feel confident to write on this uh, standard of security. Right, so trust is absolutely key, as you say, as this world becomes increasingly connected and so much, so many vulnerable and sensitive items are being shared. So it's wonderful that you've developed that both with uh, different companies both abroad and here in the United States. So a question I have for you in talking about the United States specifically is that you recently partnered with Qualcomm and released, uh, announced at CTIA that you were releasing some new products. Can you take a moment to describe them and how and what is unique about these products that are coming to market? Right, uh, so we do have a long-standing partnership with Qualcomm uh, already as Qualcomm is uh, uh, the industry leader in, in their area of technology and as we are industry leader it's only reasonable for us to, to partner with Qualcomm and in fact we have a very nice relationship with them and the recent uh, press announcement that we, we did is just uh, is another generation of uh, Qualcomm technology that we are integrating into our products and that is not so dramatic yet, but this is a platform that is for the first uh, time also uh, enabling the Java technology. And Java is an open, all, uh, all around uh, open programming standard, very accessible, very widespread in its use cases. And so we are now deliberately launching our portfolio with an open standard uh, software, which is Java. So, so this was. And the purpose for this was um, that it's going to allow for, I would think if it's an open source, then it's going to allow for development and be almost like an open API that can be integrated with a number of different products very easily and quickly. Exactly. So what, what you see today, or that was, was also one of the dramatic the developments over the past five to six years, where past then a device was made for a single use case. And it had to do uh, alarm monitoring or meter reading or a terminal transaction today. I think devices will be multipurposed and we open up via Java this multipurpose capability. Imagine that we, de we, we dissect the communication layer. Devices will always have to communicate and this is one layer and the other layer is the application layer where we now say well you know what we don't mind what the application will be in the future. This will be multipurpose devices they will hand over their data to the communication layer and we transmit and we are now putting basically Java on top of our uh, communication capabilities and thus opening up to the huge, huge world of all these Java communities and the Java developers and they will develop their application and if somebody has prototyped say a uh, health monitoring device or a kid security application or uh, how to figure out when the vineyards in France are ready for receiving water again. The community will share these applications and if somebody wants to do anything about vineyards in California or in South Africa and Chile, they just can reach into the toolbox and say, wow, great, here it is, I plug it on my device and off I go, right? And uh, I think similar, and I don't want to compare ourselves with Apple, of course, but Apple has achieved a similar capability and Android has achieved a similar capability where say here's an open software platform and my dear developer community go crazy on it. Yeah? Right. That's and great. that's what we want to do on M2M with Java. Fantastic. So it brings a lot of ubiquity in terms of the uses and the use cases and a lot of variety as well, yeah. which is going to be really exciting. So talking about that now, uh, recently also you partnered with or had an announcement with Audi and we're doing something very interesting with that. Can you describe what was what's happening with that? Oh yeah, for sure, and I'm happy to describe it. <laughs> so Lima and I guess the people on this call, they know that uh, Germany is a little bit of a car country to the point where we have no speed limits on the German highway, on the German autobahn. In some areas we do, but in general we have no general speed limits, so we did a test drive, Audi did a test drive with uh, our 4G connectivity from Berlin down to 
Ingolstadt, that's the headquarter of Audi, and uh, we were doing at the speed of 200 kilometers an hour, so I guess that's 130 miles an hour. Uh, we downstream 60 megabit per second of traffic into the car and up again. Uh, so the 130 miles were totally legal, of course, and uh, 60 megabit per second is sufficiently enough to stream about 20 to 30 high definition videos in parallel into the car. Yeah, so that's that's the piece of technology where we're pretty proud about. But uh, what's the use case behind it? You may ask, right? So um, today, if you if you hop on your car and it's connected, typically the car is connected to the network. Is is it really the user that's connected? No. So in the future, your you if you are the driver, you have your family with you, your kids, everybody has their tablets, their smartphones, their gaming consoles, each of them having a 3G, 4G connectivity, they're all in their car. And that's the vision of Audi. They say, we want to be the first broadband mobile hotspot on the street because if people are, and they are all used to their broadband connectivity in their hands with their nice devices, they said clearly that should not stop if people are mobile on the street and moving at greater distances and greater speeds. So this uh, LTE into the car will uh, enable new use cases where Number one, the, the car producer is now able to reach out to the user. Once the user has access to the Wi-Fi broadband capability in the car, the, there will be new use cases as, like I said, you know, there will be streaming applications where the kids in the, on the rear seats are looking at their own videos, they are on their online consoles, they are playing their video chats with their friends. Out of the car, how super cool is that compared to what we are used to today? Very cool. Actually, I can't wait to be in Germany so. <laughs> so I should test this car. I want a private drive. Uh, yeah, it will work nicely in the U.S. as well, actually. We had some recent test drives results out of the U.S. and it looks very, very promising and it's also good news for our industry. So compliments to the U.S. and their carriers there. The LTE coverage in the U.S. is quite remarkable already. Wonderful. And is it yeah. with the Audi Automotive or is it through other partnerships that you've been testing and seeing what's going on over here in the United States? Yeah, it's with, with, with Audi predominantly. Okay, great. Yeah, All right, then I'll, I'll have to talk to Audi here then in the United States since it's easier. Um, so looking at this, just to sort of summarize and, and bring our show to a close as we begin to look at the future. So you mentioned a couple of important elements, trust, uh, the open source ubiquity, ease of use that is coming down the line, the big data, the intelligence. So as you're putting all of this together and taking a look a little bit at the future, what do you see happening in the M2M space? Are there perhaps new industries that are not yet on board that will be coming on board? How do you see things shaping up in the next, let's say, five to ten years? So I think there will be a couple, couple of mainstreams happening. Number one, let's take connectivity as a given. Okay, be it 2G, be it 4G, let's take that as a given and not talk about it any longer, it's just there. So um, with, the, with the maturity of the industry and the initial CapEx expenses have come down, more and more industry will jump on board and go into M2M. Yeah, we have amazing use cases now where insurance industries uh, Oh, yes, traditionally have been interested to recover a stolen car, for sure, and they will continue to do that. But now they are developing business cases as how to reduce reduce the uh, accident rate of the junior drivers. How do you do that? You have to motivate the kids, and the best to motivate the kids is throw them into the into a competition on the web and give them prizes and give them a first and a second place. And this is happening now in M2M. So, and I think there will be more and more of these use cases coming up. And that's why we're pushing Java so hard, because Java is the most simplest way to get into it. Yeah, Here's your device, here's your connectivity, uh, here's our sensor logic uh, device management platform. Don't worry about this, we switch it on. You have your management screen, you manage your devices, your use case. You, my dear customer, my dear uh, enterprise, worry about your use case. What do you want to do and we'll enable that. So I think this this is where it's gonna go, and uh, that's why we're pushing hard on, on on open platforms, on standard connectivity, really to enable the industry. And I think uh, I'm really true believer into this Java community because there you find all these uh, creative people that mm, that will drive new and new and more and more imagine uh, imaginative use cases into our industry. 
Very exciting. Actually, I love the future that you just painted because it has such variety, such diversity, and it is putting it in the hands of the people to discover what is the use case that they're interested in and gives them the power to create it. So, yeah. fantastic. And my message simply is when you, when you go into M2M, don't think about technology. Think about the use case and don't be afraid. It's, it's going to work. We're going to make it happen. Fantastic. That's the way technology is supposed to be. So Norbert, I want to thank you so much for being part of this first show here on UTK Connect. It has been absolutely fantastic having you on the show. It was a pleasure, Lima. Thank you a lot. Thank you. And to everyone else, thank you so much for joining us. Please do keep on coming back to UDU Connect, to RCR TV, and to the RCRWireless.com. See you there.